All right, guys, thanks for being here this evening. I guess I get to speak into this thing because it's being recorded, so normally I wouldn't need it, but you guys can hear. It's clear, right? Okay, perfect. So tonight I get the honor of speaking to you about what it means to be a godly man, according to Scripture, okay? And so um, I want to tell you just a little bit about my journey, uh, my Christian journey, and then how that will then play into the rest of my story, okay? So um, if any of you know me or know my faith journey, you know that I grew up Roman Catholic, But at a certain point in my life, I realized that uh, I had to have a faith of my own, not a faith that I inherited from my family, right, or a culturally comfortable faith, but one that I was willing to stand on, one where I had my own convictions. And I realized that at some point in my life, it would be the end, and I would have to stand before God, and I would have to give an account for the life that I lived. I would have to give an account for what God gave me. I'd have to give an account for the faith choices I made along the way. And then I would also have to give an account after I realized of also of leading my wife and my children, okay? And so um, this search on, on having my own faith kind of led me to an area of study his, historically that I really enjoyed, which was the 16th century Protestant Reformation. And that led me to ultimately to make the decision to leave the Catholic Church and to hold the biblical positions I hold today. But in studying the Reformation, one of the things that really stood out to me was how many men that I studied along that way had a very similar faith journey to me. They grew up Catholic, they were raised in a Roman home, but at a certain point, they were confronted with biblical truth. And as similar to me, they had a choice to make. Do I remain comfortable in the life I grew up in, or do I embrace the truth that's staring me in the face, biblically? And for me, the cost was nothing more than maybe losing the culture I grew up in, or maybe a strained relationship at home, or, or losing some family relationship. But for the men I studied, it was a lot bigger deal. Often they faced much harsher choices, and some of them even faced death. And so, how many of you guys have heard Martin Luther before? Anybody heard of Martin Luther? Okay. So Martin Luther was one of these men, right? He's known as the father of the, of the Reformation when he nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg in 1517. Okay, but in 1521, he gets summoned to the Diet of Worms by Rome. And at this place, what they were doing was they were going to put him on trial. And the idea was is they were going to give him the option to recant all of his anti-Catholic teachings, or he knew what was coming next, to be condemned and likely burned at the stake. And so what they did was they put all of his stuff out in front of him, and they said, are these your writings? And he said, yes, they are. And they said, do you recant of them? And they gave him 24 hours. They gave him overnight, basically, to decide. So he had overnight to decide, am I going to recant everything I believe about what what I believe and my convictions I hold, or am I going to fold and uh, just submit to the church? And he knew that likely if he did not recant that he would be burned at the stake, as heretics in that time were. And the most famous saying of the Reformation comes out of this, and this is what happens the next day. He says, when he's asked if he would recant, he says, my conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Now, a lot of us have heard the story of Martin Luther, but a lot of us have not heard probably the story of Hugh Latimer. Has anybody ever heard of Hugh Latimer? No? All right. Hugh Latimer, he got convinced of Luther's teachings, all right? And he was in England, okay? This happens in Germany, and he's in England, and so he helps take the Reformation teachings from Europe over to England. And in doing so, As England becomes Protestant, he quickly moves up into the Church of England, becoming a bishop there. However, he was under Henry VIII. However, due to some untimely deaths during that time, Henry's half-sister comes to power. And I don't know if you guys have ever studied her, but her name was Bloody Mary. And her name was that for a reason. She was a devout Catholic, and immediately she started started, um, uh, prosecuting Protestants. And so what happens to Latimer? He's quickly arrested, and he's put on trial. Okay, he's, he's uh, put on trial for his life, and he's sentenced to death. And at his trial, he states this. He says, I thank God most heartedly that he has prolonged my life to this end, that I may, in this case, glorify God by this kind of death. And so along with his colleague, Nicholas Ridley, he was burned at the stake in 1555. But as they're being tied to the stake, he's famously quoted as saying this, as he's t- talking to Nicholas Ridley. He says this. He says, be of good cheer, Master Ridley. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England that I trust it shall never be put out. So these stories, as I studied them, they challenged me to consider the question, what does it look like to play the man? How do I play the man? What does a man look like? What would it look like to have the convictions and to stand on something that these men stood on? 
How do I become such a man of deep conviction that my friends, my family, the people that I'm closest to, that they would follow me, to have the convictions of these type of men where I could be a leader? Now, I realize in this room we all have all different types of men, right? We have the single guys. We have guys that are uh, married. We have guys that are engaged. We have guys all along the spectrum of manhood, okay? And I know you guys are fairly young in here, so... um, you know, Scripture, we're going we're gonna to go into Scripture now. We're going to look at a scriptural teaching of what it looks like to be a man of God. But there's going to be things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about married life. I'm going to talk about things when you take on a spouse and those things. But even if you're not in that situation right now, I pray that you will listen carefully because I pray that one day you guys want to be in that situation. I pray that one day you want to have a family. You want to be a leader of a family. And even if you don't, the way you lead your family at home with your parents, with your siblings, with your nieces and nephews, with your brothers that are here tonight, when you go home, when you lead other men around, I pray that you take some of this to heart. And what I do, what I hope you do, is I pray that you'll take some of these lessons away and you'll apply them to your life at a young age. Because it took me a long time. It was 33 years before God got a hold of me. And there was a lot of destruction along the way to get to that point. And what I do when I come here is I just pray. I try to, try to give you guys the truth, and then I pray that you guys will take those things and apply it. And I know when you're young, because I used to be like, this is never going to happen to me, right? I'm never going to be that guy. But I promise you, I thought that at one time too. And I ended up being that guy before I'm here today. But God used that to turn me into the man I am today. So let's turn to God's word. What does God's word say about manhood? Now, this is a large topic. Very large topic. We could go across scripture, but here's where I want us to focus tonight. I want us to focus in the first three chapters of Genesis. We're going to start at the very beginning of the book of the Bible, and then we're going to finish in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. So the four headlines I want you to take away from this tonight is a godly man embraces his identity. He lives with intention. He recognizes his imperfections, and he strives towards the ideal. We're going to look at each one of these, okay? What does it mean for a godly man to embrace his identity? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start at the beginning, right? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You guys know that we are the only creatures on this earth that are stamped with the image of God, right? We have his stamp, and this gives us our identity and separates us from all of the remainder creatures here on this earth, okay? However, the pagan world you live in now, the pagan world that you guys live in, wants you to believe there's nothing about you unique. They do not want you to believe that you're stamped with the image of God. They want you to believe you're just another creature that evolved from fish and bacteria. Okay? That's what they want you to believe. Only the strong survive. So eat, drink, be merry, and live for today. And isn't that what we see going on in the world today, all around us? But when you embrace your true identity, you embrace the reality that you are created by God, not by random chance. Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, in chapter 1 of Genesis, we get this statement of God creating. God creates, and he looks over, right? He looks upon everything he's created, male and female. He looks upon it, and he says, very good, okay? God does not make mistakes in his creation. So when God says that he made you as a man, very good, that's what God means, okay? We don't get to redefine what God says. We don't get to redefine male and female. We don't get to redefine good and evil according to social influences, right? We are very good because God says we are very good. However, culture says the opposite. Man is not very good. In fact, culture will tell you today to, to stand up like a man and act like a man is actually something that's toxic. Okay? Culture demands that we deny our manhood. It demands that we deny that very thing that God says about us being very good. Okay? So in chapter 2 then, he goes on to lay out the creation story. Let's look at this in Genesis 2, 7 through 8. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. God first creates man. We are dependent, not independent. God is our creator. We are his creatures. Okay? We have a Lord. Godly men realize not only that God has created you, that he's placed you here in this very moment for a specific purpose, but also that you have a Lord of your life. You are not Lord of your own life. God has a calling on you, and God has a purpose for you, okay? So, we do not get to determine for ourselves, okay? We do not get to be our own lords. And in my BC days, I call it my BC days, my before Christ days, all right? In my BC days, all I knew was my pride and self-righteousness, okay? And they led me to very bad decisions that almost ended my marriage and my family, all right? It was only God that humbled me. 
And it was only when I realized that it was not just that God had created me, because I knew that God created me. And I knew that God had placed me in a particular time for a particular purpose. But it wasn't really until I submitted him as my Lord that life started working out for me, okay? I realized all the truth. I had all the truth up here. But until it got from here to here, and I changed from being my own Lord to making God Lord in my life, that's when everything changed in my life. When I submitted to him, that's when things began to change. The second thing we want to see is that godly men live with intention. Back in Genesis 1, 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So much of the world today is opposed to this statement. The idea that humans would multiply and take dominion is anathema in today's culture. Okay? In fact, you will openly hear, depending on who you listen to, if you guys know who Klaus Schwab is or the World Economic Forum, any of these guys, you will openly hear them talking about how we need to reduce population on this planet. Our biggest goal should be to re reduce human impact, reduce human population. Now, one of the things we have to understand is as Christians, we are to be good stewards of this earth. Okay? We are to be good stewards. There's no doubt about that. But we worship the God who created this earth, not the earth itself. Okay? We worship the Creator. God promotes a cultural life where man multiplies and takes dominion over the living things. But our current culture promotes death. It promotes death by pushing abortion. It promotes death by pushing homosexuality, by pushing transgenderism, because the culture of death is opposed to what God wants. What God's desire is for men to take dominion, to multiply and take dominion. The culture of death is completely opposed to that. And what greater way to stop humanity from fulfilling the promise or the purpose of God to take dominion than to no longer to get us to multiply or even to lead ourselves. Because here's the truth. Two dudes, two ladies, they can't take dominion and multiply. Okay? They can never fulfill the mandate that God has on this for us. That's why, men, one of these days, when you understand it, and you probably already stand it, understand it in your class with some of them at Fort Hayes, this is the reason that they have to come for your kids. This is why in the public schools they must indoctrinate your kids because if they're killing their own, or if, they're, if they can't even have their own, they've got to make disciples somehow. And they come after the kids of the Christians because they are the ones doing what God calls us to do. Okay? They must make disciples of our kids because they don't have any. Genesis 2.15, let's continue. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Why did God plant Adam in the garden? The first thing that God does with man is he gives him a job. Okay? He gives him purpose to his life. Because work is important to God. Culture today, instead, doesn't want you to under, understand that. Doesn't want you to understand that God gave you a purpose. And if you're here someone that's struggling with purpose today in your life, and you're wondering, I do not know what in the world God put me here to do. Well, the first thing he did to Adam was he gave him a job. So if you're struggling with purpose, you might want to consider today that God simply wants you to get to work. Get a job. Get to work. Get to doing something that will further the kingdom of God in whatever you're doing. But instead, what does culture want? Culture wants you addicted to porn. It wants you addicted to your comforts. It wants you addicted to technology. It wants you enslaved to your vices. Okay? God says get to work. Culture says I want you comfortable. Because if I can keep men on the sideline and men aren't doing what men are called to do, there is no multiply. There is no dominion. Okay? God says get to work. The more time you have to work, the less time you will have to be enslaved to those vices and the filth of this world. The more you work, the more you further the kingdom of God. Then in verse 18, he says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Eve was created for Adam. Now, don't run tell all the feminists this, okay? But Eve was created for Adam. This is very important, okay? God creates, this is a truth that all of us have to understand. God creates with distinction. He creates two sexes. He creates male and female, okay? We're both created with the image of God. Both of us have the image of God stamped on us. We both have personhood. We need each other fully to fulfill the commission, right? If we're going to take dominion and multiply, we need a female in our lives, okay? But here's the big thing that no one in the world wants to talk about today that we all realize is that we all take on different roles. See, the world wants you to believe that a man can be a woman, a woman can be a man, they can do everything, and that there's, there should be this egalitarian push that everyone should be the same, and women should be able to do everything men do, and men should be able to do everything women do. But God designed us a certain way. There are certain reasons that men naturally gravitate to certain type of professions. There's reasons that women naturally 
gravitate to certain type of professions and certain type of things. It's because God's created us with a certain way and aligning our life in that way is typically what we see in culture, okay? But culture hates this idea. Culture wants you to believe that different roles means different value. But that's not what God's word says. He doesn't say we have different value. He just says we have different roles in fulfilling the commission to multiply and take dominion. The egalitarian feminist push reaches many even into our churches. You see it all the way into our churches all over the place, okay? That, that men and women have the same can have the same roles. But men like Martin Luther and Hugh Latimer were never ashamed of the, of the good word of God. And too often what I see men in our culture, that's the first thing they do is they get shamed by what God's word says. They allowed the culture to cower them, okay? And they're silent. Genesis 2, 21 through 24 says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, <clears throat> took one of his ribs and closed it, up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man was created first. Man was made out of the dust. God breathed into him, but then woman was made from man. Okay, And man and woman are dependent upon God. And woman is dependent upon man. This is the creation order, okay? This is the way God created things. Regardless of what culture says, this is what God's word says. Now look back in verse 23. It says that she is named by Adam. She's made from him. She's dependent on him for her existence. And she's named for him or named by him. Again, are we ashamed of this truth? I mean, this is the honest truth of God's word. Because culture tells you that you should be ashamed of this thing. And then in verse 24. Guys, this is very important. Verse 24 provides three action steps for godly men, okay? Three action steps for godly men in verse 24. We're going to read all of them. Godly men leave their families, right? He says you're going to leave mother and father. Now, I cannot tell you how many Christian men I have run into that struggle with this one, leaving mom and dad, okay? They get engaged, they get married, and yet mom and dad are still too involved in their lives, okay? When you take a wife, there's still a commandment for you to honor your father and mother, Okay, but your wife is now part of your one flesh. Okay, so when mom and dad are do, try to do more than become advisors in your life, which they should be at that point, then you're to stand up for your wife because that's the job of the man. Okay, you take a vow to let no man separate you from your wife, and that no man includes your mom and dad. Okay, you honor them, but at that point, they only become advisors. The second thing we see is that godly men cleave to their wives. This idea of holding fast. What does it mean to hold fast to someone in your life? It means you don't cleave to your buddies anymore. It means you don't cleave to your hobbies anymore. It means you don't cleave to your job and trying to get a fat 401k so when you can retire. It means you cleave to your wife. You're no longer striving for things of the world. You cleave to her. Because besides your relationship with God, there is no more relationship more important than you and your wife. Why is it that we see our culture and our families and everything in ruin that we see today? It's because the primary institution of marriage has been so degraded. Okay? It's no longer seen as a covenant. It's just seen as a contract that you can get in and out of every time you want to, whenever it feels good. The third thing we see is that godly men weave a life together. It says they become one flesh. Now, this is way more than just sexual union, okay, guys? This is the idea that you become one flesh. You become one with your spouse, and this is the formation of the first family, okay? This is the first institution that God creates on this earth is family. No wonder it's the first thing that the world wants to destroy because if you can destroy the family, you can destroy the kids, you can destroy the kids, you can get them to do all the stuff they're doing in culture today, and then you can destroy civilization because the building block of any civilization is the family. And here's the thing, guys. If you read in those verses, and we talked about all the description about God created, and God did this, and man, but these three are all action steps of men. There's no, the women aren't acting here. This is what God says men do. God do these three things, or men do these three things, okay? These are not passive words. These are action words. Men are supposed to be active in their life, all right? These are not passive words. They're active. And this is, what, this is the pre-fall call on men. But... When we flip the page to Genesis chapter 3, we all know what happens there, right? That's what we call the fall. That's where sin enters the world, okay? So before sin enters the world, before the fall, men are supposed to be active. They're not supposed to be passive, all right? But then Genesis chapter 3 happens, and we see that godly men recognize their imperfections. 
This is one of the most important things you can do as men is to be good self-examiners, to be humble enough to look yourself in the mirror and recognize your shortcomings. Be able to have other brothers in your life who you can call upon to say, hey, I'm struggling on this. Hey, I need you to give me an honest evaluation here of my life. See, God establishes a creation order, right? We've already seen God creates man out of dust. He creates woman from man, both created in his image to multiply and take dominion. God says this is good, okay? But then we see in Genesis 3, 1 through 8, the adversary, the serpent comes in, right? And what does he do? Who does he speak to first? Who does he go after? He goes after Eve, right? He attacks Eve. What is, how does God create? God, Adam, Eve, Okay, so if he wants to destroy Adam underneath God, he just goes to Eve. He subverts the creation order, okay? The creation order is God, Adam, Eve. Who does he go to? He goes to Eve to subvert the whole creation order, okay? To attack man who's directly under God, he attacks him through woman. And they act together to reject the wisdom of God and determine for themselves what they will do. And this is when sin enters the world for the first time. It's what we call the fall of humanity. It's what we talk about when we talk about inheriting the guilt of sin. You know, the original sin idea that we inherit that nature to sin. That all of us are fallen and sinful from that point on. But in Genesis 3.9, the serpent attacks Eve. Eve is the first to sin. Adam's right there with her, we're told. But who does God come looking for when God comes looking? I mean, God already knows what happened. But who does God come looking for to hold accountable? Is it Eve? Now, it's Adam, right? He comes looking for Adam, okay? And likewise, men, no matter what happens in your life, no matter who you can blame it on, you can do the whole blame game thing like Adam and Eve did. When, a te- when accounting time comes, it's going to be you that's going to be standing before God, all right? Whether you like it or not. How well you steward your life and the blessings he gives you, whether you're single or married, it doesn't matter. You will give an accounting before God, and you won't be able to say it was someone else's fault, Okay? Now, in Genesis chapter 2, before we got into the fall discussion, we saw that man was to be active. He was to be leading, right? He was to leave. He was to cleave. He was to weave. These are very active things that men are to be doing. But instead, what do we see in the fall? We see Adam being passive, right? If you read it, it says that she sinned, but that Adam was with her, okay? Adam had the direction of God not to eat. Adam was with his wife. He He knew the rules, and he did the opposite, okay? Because here's the deal, the fruit looked too good. They gave into the lust of the flesh instead of trusting in God's goodness. Think about this, God had given them everything else, right? You read the story, God had given them everything except this one thing. He's like, let me just have this one thing. Trust me for your best, just let me have this one thing. But when I recognized the truth of this whole thing for me, what hit me in the face was they were just discontent, right? And I think about looking about all the sin back in my life and my BC days. And if you boil it all down, you can boil it down to a couple things. But it was pride. I wasn't submitted to God. And I was discontent. And those two things are a bad combination for men. Okay? We all have to fight these things every time. And then I was passive. I realized that I was just like Adam. So many of my own sin, I could have, I mean, I could have stopped. If I look back, there were so many opportunities to take an off-ramp. But I was passive along the way. Okay, I was discontent and I was convicted. I was convicted that I was being just like Adam. Present, not in the way I was supposed to be. I mean, I was there. I was in my family. I mean, technically I was the man. I was married. I was the man that was supposed to be leading. I was, I was physically present, but I wasn't present in the way that God called me to lead. And see, men, this is the tendency of all men. All men have that fallen nature to be passive. Whether you're single or married, it doesn't matter. It could be in your relationships if you are married or with a, if you have a girlfriend or, or if you have a, you know, you're engaged, whatever. We have the natural tendency, because of the fall of Adam, to be passive. And passivity will lead to sin. At some point, it will lead to sin. Either it will, le- it will lead to a sin where you're outright sinning or when you're not doing what you know you should be doing, just like Adam did, okay, with Eve. See, I was comfortable watching my wife lead. It was easier right? Renee would just take the lead. Like if something needed to be done in our home or whatever, I mean, I was providing, I was working, I was doing all these things. I was comfortable watching Renee lead. So when it came to the spiritual education of our kids, Renee took the lead. When it came to pretty much anything of importance with our kids, Renee took the lead. I was comfortable. But see, that was, the problem was, is the only reason she was doing it was because I wasn't, okay? And she was never designed to do that, okay? Renee was designed to be my helper, not my leader, all right? A woman in your life is designed to be your helper and not your leader. 
And then we see the result of the fall. What happens, men? What happens in Genesis after this? We see, in, we pick up in verse 16 of, of Genesis 3. Judgment comes. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Hear that point again. You des- your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it on all the days of your life. Thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. See, now, men, we live the results of this fall. This is where we're at now. It may not be where we want to be, but it's the reality of where we live, okay? Work is hard. It's often not enjoyable for a lot of us, right? We fight the constant battle of passivity like Adam did. And on top of that, we have the curse given to the woman, where her desire is going to be contrary to her husband. So just like when Eve made the first decision that got them into sin, Adam was passive, every relationship that we see, and we often wonder why there's so much conflict in relationships. Why is there so much conflict in a relationship with husband and wife, with boyfriend and girlfriend? Why? Because men are passive and women want to dominate over their men. Exactly what we see here in Genesis chapter 3. This is a result of the fall, okay? Why do we see the feminist movement pushing against toxic masculinity? This is exactly why. They want to dominate over men. This is a result of the fall of man, okay? It's because of our fallen nature. It all goes back to this. But every day, here's the thing, men. Every day you have to make a decision when you get out of bed to lead. You have to make the decision not to be passive and to be active. We must lead. We must serve. We must work. And again, these are all active words. These are actions of men, not passive things. But too often, what happens when men realize this? They fall into two ditches. Okay? When men realize this the first time and they realize, oh my gosh, I'm that passive guy. I've got to do something. I've got to act. They fall into two ditches. Two ditches. One of them is, is they become a dictator in their home, right? They swing. All, the pendulum swings from one side all the way to the other, and they're like, honey, I'm the leader of this family, and you're just going to do what I'm telling you. And they become dictator, and that's abuse. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Your woman's supposed to be your helper. That's why God put her there. You're supposed to lead her, okay? The other way that we sin is by, um, by not leading at all. We, we, we sin by not leading, and the pendulum swings all the way to where we become dictators on the other side. Both of those are sin. We have to find the balance in between and find the balance according to God's word. Okay? So we look at how the pagan culture and many men in our churches agree with abusing women. Did you know that? Have you guys ever thought, if you actually look at culture, and a lot of you guys today sitting in here, actually you might not know it, but you agree with abusing women. And let me give you a couple examples of how I know you do. All right? Because we allow subpar talented men to go out in sporting events with women just to dominate women in sporting events. And often you see these things on TV, right, where these, these girls are getting physically injured because some dude is too big and too strong, even though he's one of the worst dudes ever in his own sport, but he goes into the women's sport and he excels. Okay, that's physical abuse, right? And likewise, we perpetuate physical abuse through human trafficking. Oh, how many of us would not want to know how much we, per- we perpetuate this sin through human trafficking, okay? We abuse our wives and girlfriend by watching porn. If you are into porn, you are perpetuating human trafficking, all right? We abuse women in that way. Not only do we abuse the women on the other end of that screen, but you're abusing your girlfriend, you're abusing your wife, you're abusing your person you're engaged to because that that you are taking away from them, you're stealing from them. Okay, that's something that's supposed to be only for the woman in your life. So if you're watching porn and masturbating to someone else that you will never meet, you are perpetuating that type of human trafficking against women. And all of us have to look ourselves in the mirror at some point and say, we are helping abuse women in this culture. We can look at the guy out there playing the transgender sport and we can say, oh my gosh, that's so bad. But if we're honest, if we look ourselves in the mirror, like I said, and we do a self-evaluation, we might even be worse than that by what we look at on screen and what we take in with our eyes. God made us to have a helper in our lives. And when God gives that to us, remember what I talked about, the original sin? What was the thing in the garden? They had everything but one. What was the sin that he struggled with? Contentment, right? Why do we go out and watch porn? Why do we go out and do all these things? It's because we're not content, right? It's about us. We haven't submitted to the lordship of God in our lives. 
We justify our sin in our minds because we think that our wives, our girlfriends, those around us can't see it. It's kind of that sin that people don't see, right? Shame on us, men. We need to repent. As Christian men, we have to be, if we're going to call the culture to repentance for everything we see in it, it's got to start right here. It's got to start in our hearts. Repentance must start with us. And trust me, I understand it's very difficult. If you're addicted to pornography, if you struggle with that, you've got to find accountability partners. You've got to find somebody to talk to. You've got to find somebody to get in the battle with every single day because that is an addiction like so many other things. And you've got to have good brothers and people around you that can help you that. Because here's the thing, men. If we're honest, if we look back and we just take an honest evaluation of ourselves, if we're honest and we just look ourselves in the mirror, what we'll really find is this. We'll find ourselves fallen, passive, and discontent boys. That's really what we'll find, okay? But that's not the call for God. We're not to stay those things. We're not to stay boys. We're, we're called to become men, okay? So how do we do that? How do we become men? We've looked at all the bad stuff now. How do we become those men? Well, godly men strive towards the ideal. Knowing that we live in a fallen world and that we have the tendency to be passive, what do we do, right? Well, we have to look to something. We have the sin of the old Adam, okay? We have the sin of the old Adam, his stain on us, all right? We inherit his guilt. We inherit his passivity. So what do we do? We look to the new Adam. Scripture tells us the perfect Adam, God's son, Jesus Christ, that came down to earth and died for us, okay? We can't blame it just that I was created this way. We cannot do that, okay? We can't say we were created this way just because you didn't have a good earthly father, and if you didn't, I apologize for that. I am so sorry if that is you, but that is not an excuse for us to act like ungodly men, okay? We must push back against the cultural narrative of victimhood, right? We look at culture, and we see everyone's a victim in culture, and then we'll turn around and say, well, you know, sin really isn't my fault. You know, I struggled this and that. And we put ourselves in the victimhood culture right away. We must repent of victimhood culture because the victimhood culture is like Satan whispering in Eve's ear, right? You're not a sinner. It's someone else's fault. You're not that bad of a person, right? You know better than God. That's what the victimhood culture tells us today. Everyone wants to be a helpless victim. But instead, if we're honest with ourselves and we understand our own sinfulness, we understand our own fallenness, we will realize that, in fact, we are the perpetrators, not the victims. We are the perpetrators of so many of the things that happen in our lives. It's because of our sin. It's pride. It's discontentment. It's passivity. Those are the things that cause our sin. So instead of blaming others for our faults, we focus our gaze upon the one that came. We focus our gaze upon and we imitate the ideal man, that being the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to finish up tonight. Paul is addressing something very important here. He's addressing, he says, how should believers, I assume that all of you here tonight, so you're all believers, I'm going to make that assumption. I hope that's correct. Paul is addressing how do believers live with each other, okay? How is it that as brothers in this room, with your sisters down there, how do you live as believers, okay? And he says in verse 1 of Ephesians 5, he says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God. That's number one. That's the ideal we want to strive for. We want to imitate God, not the fallen, sinful examples that we see in our world today. Okay? Now, you can have your own opinion of these guys. I don't really care what your opinion on them they really are. But the one thing you shouldn't be doing is you should not, should not be imitating the people you see in culture. We shouldn't be imitating guys like Andrew Tate. We should not be imitating guys like LeBron James or Kanye West or even Jordan Peterson. Listen, I love listening to Jordan Peterson. He says he touches on a lot of the truths that men need to hear in this world. But he should not be who we're trying to emulate. He should be just someone who is a vessel of the truth, and we should be looking towards the ideal, which is Jesus Christ. We imitate God the Father like Jesus did. And how did Jesus imitate God the Father? He submitted to him. That's what he did. And he says, if you guys want to imitate just like me, I submitted to the Father, you submit to me. Look in verse 21. He goes on through this whole line, and we don't have time to get into it. But in verse 21, he sums it up this way. He says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the way you look towards the ideal man is you submit because Christ submitted. Okay? Out of love and reverence for Christ, we submit to one another. All right? There's godly submission there. And then what he goes on to do is he goes on to say, okay, how does this look practically in real life? Right? What does it look like to imitate, to submit yourself? And so typically what people do is they think these are the marriage passages that go on after this. And it is a marriage passage, but he's using the marriage illustration as how every believer, married or not, is called to live in the church, is called to live as a Christian. 
So in verses 22 through 24, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, here we go. This is the establishment of the creation order that we talked about before. Woman submits to man, man submits to God. He's reestablishing that creation order that was broken up in the fall. And again, this is difficult because of the fall. Man is passive. Women desire to rule over their men. That's why we see so many things going on in our culture today and so much of the strife. Verses 25 through 28. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. See, men, submission is easy when we're on the same page. When everything's going well, submission's easy, right? But what happens when things aren't going well? The test of true submission is when disagreements happen. And this is what it looks like to love sacrificially. This is why God put this in the order he did. Man is supposed to lay down his life as Christ laid down his life for the church. That means you die to self. That means you die to everything you think is the most important to you. When you take on another person in your life, all the things about you go away. They get put to the side. Okay? You submit yourself to Christ. That means every day when you're getting up, if you want to be a better godly man to any woman that comes in your life, that means when you get up every day, even if you're single, you're saying, God, how can I imitate you? How can I get closer to you? How can I get more to the image of Christ so one day when I do get a woman and you bring a woman into my life, if you haven't yet, I will be that man who deserves her. Okay? Let me submit to you. Let me submit to you in my sexual desires. Let me submit to you in how I handle myself out in public, how I use my tongue, how I have interactions with other people. We submit to each other as we imitate Christ. And if we imitate Christ and he submitted to the Father, all things will go a lot better in our lives by simply doing that, okay? We don't love the world, we love Christ. And we see that he lays down his life for his church, so you lay your life down for your spouse or your brother and sister, okay, in the Lord. Christ redeems his bride by washing her with his word, and you redeem your bride or you help redeem your friends who are in the church by laying down your passivity and selfishness so that you might lead. And here's the thing. This is something that's so important. It took me a long time, guys, to get this figured out. How many of you guys right now in here have a significant other? Okay, several of you? Okay, I have significant others. It took me a long time to understand this. Guys that are single, I want you to understand this. Now, this might sound completely counterintuitive to you, but it says that he might present her to your Lord one day holy. Okay? It doesn't say ever in Scripture that you're to present your bride before God happy. Okay? Your call as a man is never to lead your wife towards happiness. Guys, I spent a long time trying to lead my wife towards happiness, and it was the biggest destructive thing that I had to do because I had to be passive in order to do that. If I was going to make Renee happy, I had to lay down certain things. I'm not saying I was a godly man at that time, but there were certain things that I knew that maybe we shouldn't be doing or people we shouldn't be hanging out with. Right? I could see destruction in our future. I could see the, the train wreck coming in our lives. But I was just trying to make her happy. Right? I was just like, man, how can I make her happy? How can I do this? How can I do this? But my call was never to make her happy. My call was to present her as holy. And there's a big difference between those two. Okay? Your call, men, is never to keep your woman happy. It's to keep her ha holy. Okay? And the more holy you become, the more holy you become, and you submit to your Lord, the easier it is for your woman to submit to you. Okay, If you're struggling with a significant other and she is not able to submit to you in a Christian way, you need to ask yourself, am I properly submitting to the Lord? Because if you are, it will make it much easier for your young lady to submit to you. So you can be passive just like I was and try to keep people happy, or you can actively lead your wife towards the holiness of God. You will be held accountable either way. God's going to come looking for you, not for her. Okay? And then I want to finish up with one last thing, Ephesians 6, 4. He says one very important thing, men. After he gives the directions about marriage and about women, he says this. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. If or when you have children, pastor your own children. Do not turn them over to youth pastors. Do not turn them over to teachers at school. Get involved, okay? Like in all of our relationships, the temptation with our kids is to be passive. You think, I'm going, you know, I'm working all the time. I'm putting all these hours in. I'm providing for our kids. And, you know, the culture tells me that's all I need to do. 
that's not all you need to do, man. You have got to be active in your kids' education because they are getting educated somewhere if it's not by you, and you all know this, all right? We're called to reject passivity. In the education of your kids, in your kids' life, in your marriage, men, you got to be active. Reject passivity because the greatest inheritance you can ever have are your children. And if you're going to fulfill the kingdom mandate, which is to multiply and take dominion, your kids are the avenue to do that, okay? And here's the thing. You guys know you're pretty young. You're soaking everything up, right? Everything that comes at you, you're soaking up. And your kids, when they're younger, will soak everything up, so get to educating them. Because if you don't, someone will. They're going to get educated on the Internet. They're going to get educated on TikTok. They're going to get educated somewhere else, okay? They're going to fill their minds with something, so help them fill it with the right stuff. And here's the thing. I want you to, I want you to end on this, just like we talked about with women when we talked about pornography. Abuse is not just physical, Okay? And I think sometimes we can get lulled into sleep thinking that when we see some dude hitting on a woman, that that's the only type of abuse there is. But there's way more abuse than just the physical. And with our children, it's the same way. You can neglect your children without hitting them. You can neglect your children by not being part of their lives and just turning them over to the world. You can simply neglect your children in that way. So let me encourage you, do not turn your kids over when you have them. I pray you all do, and you, I pray that you fulfill the kingdom mandate, and you multiply, and you have three, four, or five kids, however many you do. When you do that, be engaged in their lives. Be active. Men are called to be active, not passive. So as we conclude, I can give you no better charge than what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. At the end of the letter, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Basically, what he's saying is play the man. That's what he's saying. Hey, guys, play the man. That's what he's saying, okay? And like Mr. Latimer, godly men will be those who will stand with their convictions. And, you know, I often think to myself when I think about those examples I gave you at the beginning of, of, of Martin Luther and Hugh Latimer. I mean, Martin Luther was constantly, was, he was being hunted all the time. I mean, the story of how they, I mean, if you don't know how after he gets done with that whole thing, they, his friends kidnap him out of town so he doesn't get burned at the stake, okay? They kidnap him, and they take him, and he has to hide out and, and all these things, and, the, and the, the Catholic Church is constantly trying to get him so they can kill him, okay? So he constantly lived in that fear. But then you had Hugh Latimer, who gladly went and got burned at the stake. And I keep thinking to myself, what would it take in my own life to have that type of conviction? I mean, we live in America. We live in the freest, supposedly the freest nation in the world, right? And we have all these comforts. And I keep thinking, what would it take for me to have that type of conviction? And I don't think we all will know until we get pushed to that point, right? But if we aren't doing little things in our lives, if we aren't rejecting passivity in the little things of our lives, we will never, ever stand with conviction when the big things come in our lives, okay? So as we conclude, I just want to pray with you guys that you will do this like Mr. Latimer said, that you will light a candle in your own lives, okay, of proper manhood and in future generations that no one can ever put out. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good, and we thank you for who you are and what you do. God, we pray that you show us your grace and mercy in those areas where we struggle. We pray that you convict us in our hearts where we're passive, and then give us the brothers around us to help build us up, to do life with, to do um, community with. And Father, we just pray that um, in our everyday lives that we, um, that we reject passivity, that we stand where you call us to stand, that we call good what you call good and evil what you call evil. And God, we do not allow um, this culture to dictate um, what we believe, but instead we stand on the convictions of your word like so many brave men who have come before us. God, I pray that you bless each one of these men here today with a wonderful future, with a bride that you will bring into their life to bless them with a big family. And Lord, I just pray that these men would find the conviction in their heart, that they would find the fortitude in their soul to stand up and be a man who leads with conviction. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.